Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Nelson Trujillo and I'm a cardiologist here at Boulder Heart and I'm joined uh, this afternoon with my newest greatest partner Maria Anderson um, and uh, we've been asked this morning or this afternoon I guess to talk a little bit about what's new in cardiology and uh, maybe spend a little time talking about some of the new recommendations about aspirin maybe about salt and then give us a give you guys a little uh, chance to understand where we're coming from as it relates to primary care as it relates to heart disease we want to prevent heart attacks and stroke and uh, Dr. Anderson and I have some different perspectives about that and we wanted to share them with you so welcome Maria it's so great to have you here <laughs> thank you it's a pleasure to be here and as uh, Dr. Trujillo mentioned my name is Dr. Maria Anderson I'm a cardiologist and also specifically an electrophysiologist or heart rhythm specialist um, and I carry a board certification in lifestyle medicine um, as well, which is uh, going over all the different things that we as individuals can do for our own health um, in addition to uh, what our physicians recommend for us. Um, and as you mentioned, Nelson, there have been, um, there are always uh, journal articles, medical research being done about what we can do for ourselves to take control of our health and improve our outcomes and avoid chronic illness and avoid heart attacks and heart failure and as you mentioned um, there have recently been a couple that have made news yeah so I guess we'll we'll do the elephant in the room first which is uh, we probably have had I don't know how many phone calls about aspirin and uh, you know I, I love aspirin uh, it comes from willow bark so willow bark tea for those of you who don't want to take St. Joseph's chewable my favorite by the way um, and, and the question comes up, should we take aspirin? And uh, uh, Maria, what are your thoughts? And uh, I guess, I, you, what, what are your thoughts? Sure, so um, aspirin uh, clearly has effects that prevent blood clots. And blood clots are um, the, uh, the straw that breaks the camel's back in terms of causing a heart attack. Generally, a heart attack or a blocked artery um, in the heart is caused by progressive, usually years, of buildup of blockages in the arteries. And then the ultimate thing that happens is these blockages can break and that will trigger blood clot to form on top of that and block all the blood flow through the heart arteries. And that's what we call a heart attack. Um, and uh, breaking up that blood clot or preferably preventing a blood clot on top of a blockage is one of the hallmarks of treating, um, treating uh, blocked heart arteries. And aspirin is, has a key role to play in that regard. So for many years, we've known that aspirin in people who've had a prior heart attack um, prevents um, another heart attack and really should definitely be continued in people. People who've had a prior heart attack uh, should take an aspirin every day. Now, there has also long been the thought that um, if it can be used to prevent a second heart attack, can we use it to prevent the first one? And that has pros and cons to it. On an individual level and as heart doctors, uh, we like to see people, uh, especially those who we think are at particularly high risk of getting a heart attack, say those who have very high blood pressure or who smoke or have very high cholesterol or diabetes, um, we like to see those folks taking an aspirin. However, this latest research uh, does show that on a population level, when we give aspirin to prevent a first heart attack um, to millions and millions of people, um, many millions of them um, do fine, but others can, in addition to perhaps having prevention of heart attack, can have untoward effects of that. And those specifically uh, center around bleeding. Since aspirin helps prevent blood clots, it can also increase the risk of bleeding, including serious bleeding, through your stomach, through ulcers, and through your intestines as well. So um, this latest information that's been published um, lets us think, well, it giving certainly giving aspirin to people who've had a prior heart attack it has more benefit than this risk of um, uh, increased bleeding. But for people who've never had a heart attack, right now it seems that the weight of the evidence might suggest that this risk of bleeding could be a little bit worse than the benefit we see from uh, giving all these millions of people aspirin. What are your thoughts, Nelson? Yeah, so uh, um, I think, you know, obviously we want to prevent a heart attack. And, uh, and more important to me really than a heart attack, even though I'm a cardiologist, is to prevent stroke. 
So since these are all vascular events, I think the first thing to say is if you have a cardiologist and you're on aspirin, you should stay on aspirin. Um, and if you're taking aspirin and your doctor has prescribed it to you, it is worth a conversation about whether you should continue. Um, so it's definitely not a blanket statement to either start or stop aspirin. Um, the U.S. Preventative Task Force, which is where all of this information comes from, is a really interesting organization. They are, they are population-based, so they're interested in, every, in everybody as a whole, not as individuals. Um, they're, they're, what they did was they, um, they commissioned a study to look at all the available literature. They didn't restudy this issue, so they've just looked at data that's been collected over um, many, many years. And they haven't made a recommendation yet. They've just asked for comment. So the other thing about this recent news article, it wasn't a strong recommendation to do anything different. It's, a, it's an opportunity for us as providers and populations to comment on how we feel about this. And I couldn't really have said it better. Um, you know, we're always uh, weighing the risks and benefits. And, um, you know, to put this in a, a simpler term, you know, it's the and Maria, I'd love your thoughts. You know, if I go to McDonald's and have a cheeseburger, I'm making a risk-benefit analysis. Um, you know, should that cheeseburger, you know, is it worth my, you know, the delicious cheeseburger or the heart disease it's going to cause? And sometimes I might choose the cheeseburger and sometimes I might not. And I think um, aspirin is one of those things where we're making a choice. Um, uh, there's no question in our group of people, those that we take care of here at Boulder Heart, um, they should be on aspirin for the most part. Um, because they, they have real reason to be on it. For those of us that have no disease, that are completely healthy, should we take a medicine to prevent? That's where the, the question really comes in. And so um, what I've learned from this recent article and all the phone calls is it's definitely worth a conversation. Um, and we shouldn't make choices um, pro or against right at the moment just based on this one little uh, news article. Um, and the U.S. Preventative Task Force hasn't yet um, come down one way or the other. Just for context, you know, they have strong feelings about mammography, which are not supported by the oncology world. So they do make recommendations for the general population that um, those of us who take care of either cancer or heart disease or diabetes that we don't always agree with um, because we take care of people with illness. So um, uh, interesting times, and we'll, we'll await more information to make stronger recommendations. Yeah, and I think you really highlighted the difference between population recommendations. What should we, as a population of human beings through our health organizations, um, recommend for groups of millions of people? Yeah. And that can differ uh, to what you and your doctor determine is best for you. Um, so as an individual, uh, as Dr. Trujillo mentioned, it's, it's best to really sit down and, and together go over your risk and benefit yeah. of any medical treatment. The other thing that made, really brought up for me a little bit, which is, you know, we're all Americans here, for the most part, I guess, um, and we have this fascination, to some degree, with what a pill can do for us. So, you know, uh, you know, we're talking about should we go to the store and buy St. Joseph's chewable aspirin to prevent a disease? And, and, I, and, I, and I worry about that because there is so much we can do with our lifestyle. Um, and in many ways, you know, it makes me say, well, you know, why are we talking about a pill for prevention and not talking about lifestyle options? So I guess I'm, I'm curious, Mary, what your thoughts are about contemporary, you know, where should we be if we're not going to take aspirin? I mean, what should we be doing lifestyle-wise so that we don't need aspirin? And thankfully, we know so much about what healthy behaviors are and what um, things that we do that can conversely be unhealthy in terms of preventing heart disease, which we treat, heart failure, heart arrhythmias, which I specifically treat, but also other chronic illnesses like high blood pressure, diabetes, sleep apnea, obesity, uh, those kinds of things. There are many things that individuals can do uh, to prevent uh, suffering chronic illness and their effects. And those things um, are very importantly uh, your diet. And while there always seems like there's a lot of controversy about diet, um, the bulk of evidence really agrees very broadly that we should be emphasizing and eating a lot of whole fruits, whole vegetables, 
whole grains and uh, protein, especially from, um, from plant sources like beans and seeds and nuts. And those are universally found to benefit us in terms of cancer risk as well as heart disease and those other illnesses we talked about. And then conversely, while you'll often see things uh, that are unhealthy or that compare one unhealthy thing to another and make it seem confusing about which is the least healthy thing, uh, we know that from a dietary standpoint, we should um, avoid salt, sugar, and fat that's added to our diet. So fruit, for example, has natural sugars in it, but it's combined with so many other things that in the form of a whole apple um, has a net strong benefit for one. Um, and uh, there are other compounds in food that may have fats, but when we add fats and add sugars and add salt, especially through processed foods and restaurant foods, that's when it can increase our risk of chronic illness. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think, um, you know, the move, the move towards a whole food plant-based diet um, would obviate the need for aspirin. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, we know from studies of hunter-gatherers, uh, you know, primitive cultures that still exist in the world, um, for those populations who, for whatever reason, have, you know, LDL cholesterols that are quite low, uh, really whole food plant-based, they don't get cardiovascular disease. They that's don't true. need aspirin, they don't need statins, they don't need me. And, and that's awesome. And so um, I always love uh, the paleo movement um, because reality is uh, if you look at the paleo people, first of all they were dead by 25, um, and if we really look at how our paleolithic partners ate, um, first of all they were hungry three months out of the year, um, so they were very calorie restricted and really for the most part um, the gathering uh, was the, the big part of it, the hunting now and again. And so I, I, I'm, I'm in your camp with this whole food plant-based approach. Uh, occasionally we get lucky. Um, and I think it is important to realize that guilty pleasure is another part of the human condition. And so when we look at, oh wow, should, should you know, what about a piece of meat or a chicken filet sandwich at Wendy's? You know, those are guilty pleasures and you know, that's, that might be worth it. But as, as far as living and keeping us healthy, there is so much we can do so that we actually don't have to have a U.S. Preventative Task Force opinion about aspirin. <laughs> and that, I think, is a good segue into the um, additional recommendations about salt. Yeah. Um, which, uh, again, on the population level, what uh, this recent guidelines about salt would be to reduce uh, salt intake uh, beyond what what is average for today and we eat far far too much salt more than four grams a day is in the standard American diet. How much is four grams you think? Is that like how many tablespoons is that? <laughs> I feel like that's close to a third of a, a quarter of a cup of salt. Which is it's, crazy it's an amount of salt. It's a lot of salt. Yeah, that, that's that probably on. not the exact right tablespoon measure but it's it's a lot of salt and the bulk of that salt right comes from restaurant food they think about 70 percent where the portion sizes that we get nowadays are about four times what a, what a portion size is needed to to maintain health and provide adequate calories and nutrition so we're eating four times as much and they put in two three times as much as, as salt to enhance uh, flavor um, in addition packaged foods right um, are a major source anything that comes in a package and one surprising source of salt, the biggest single source of salt in the American diet will surprise most of us, and that is bread. Wow. Bread in terms of tortillas, sliced bread, rolls, sandwiches, pizza crust, that has an awful lot of salt and adds up to be the single um, most uh, strong source of excess sodium in wow. the diet. And what this new, rec new data comes out backs up all the data we've known for a long time, that when we add all this salt to our diet and eat, you know, a normal amount of salt for health that's just found in foods might be one and a half grams a day, say. And when we're taking in three, four, five grams of salt a day, that tends to increase a lot of chronic illness and especially uh, our high blood pressure contributes to heart disease, contributes to risk of stroke, as you've mentioned, um, and blocked heart arteries. Well seems like rather than having conversation and sort of stressing about 
more medicine, we should really sort of focus our attention more on what we can do with our fork. I think that's really true. And on top of that, things that you intrinsically, I think, know are healthy, like getting exercise, about 150 to 300 um, minutes a week. So two, two and a half to five hours a week of exercise that gets your heart rate up, gets you sweating a little bit. Uh, that's considered um, ideal and critical for reducing heart disease and cancer and other chronic illnesses. As well, of course, not smoking. Um, we can't emphasize that enough. And while it's decreased tremendously since either of us was in medical training years ago, um, still there's a, a good chunk of folks who we see all the time in um, post-heart attack who continue to smoke. And quitting smoking remains one of the best things that you can do for yourself. That's awesome. I always think about exercise. You know, I'm not a big exercise fan. I don't really like exercise. I like recess. Um, you know, when we were little kids, you know, at 11 o'clock, from 11 to 11.20, we went out and played. We skipped rope. We played hopscotch. We played Red Rover. Um, <laughs> kick the and, can. Let's kick the can. Uh, and God forbid, at least in my case, the nuns keep my us kick. from having exercise or keep us having recess. We, we were up. We were up. I mean, we, we just couldn't stand that. <laughs> so I would encourage, I mean, exercise is fine, but some, for some of us it's a bad word. You know, we have to get in gym clothes and go to the gym. But even if we just went outside or and, and danced, you know, with the music playing for 20 minutes twice a day, that would really do it. Brisk walking. Yeah. The other thing I'd encourage is sunshine. I mean, you know, uh, Maria and I were just talking about how lovely it was this morning. I don't know if, how many people were outside looking at the fall colors, but, you know, the sun is a whole food too. And uh, you know, being outside for 25 minutes, 15 minutes a day, it's good for our vitamin D levels. Uh, there's you know an epidemic of low vitamin D these days, uh, and, and that's a nice way to get it. Naked in the sun, 25 minutes works pretty well, um, and it gets you outside. Uh, really can help bring down your blood pressure and, and, and keep you safe. So I guess you know from our point of view, um, aspirin is important, especially if you have a cardiologist. Um, it's always worth a conversation with your, your care team to see whether it's right for you or you should stay on it. Um, boy, it would be great if we could use lifestyle and uh, a little, little changes so that we wouldn't even have to have the conversation about aspirin. Um, reducing salt would be great for our blood pressure and our overall health and people are poisoning us with it, it seems like, in our diet. Um, I tend, I don't know how you do it with your cooking, I'm curious, you know, I, I don't uh, add salt unless I taste it first, so I mean that's just a simple thing. Um, I did see this great, and you know, this is so interesting, in one of our major cardiac journals, there was a Mrs. Dash's trial where they used non-salt uh, seasoning and showed a reduction in blood pressure and overall mortality using salt substitutes, so Mrs. Dash's is great, um, yeah. Maria and I both have are involved in this lifestyle world and um, one of the you know seasoning is a great way to make vegetables taste better and um, there are lots of great seasonings besides salt you know Absolutely. get your turmeric out we know that that helps and um, so uh, trying different things might be really helpful yes um, and once we're able again I think to meet in person um, in groups of 20 so or say both of us are trained in uh, plant-based cooking for specifically for health outcomes yeah and bringing that um, back to the community I think will was something we're really looking forward to cooking show I think we need to have a cooking show what do you say agree more I'm in. Yeah. we'll all be wealthy if you haven't gotten vaccinated make sure you get vaccinated this COVID thing is in our control and uh, we all strongly recommend that Couldn't and uh, we're here to help if you need us Agreed.